dreamt I'd wear the jersey on All Ireland final day. Stand out there in Crow Park with the mighty part to play. And we'd line up with the captain and march behind the band. And when they played the anthem, we'd face the flag. Sean uh, was born uh, in Tum. Uh, most people. I've always associated him with Bishop Street, but in fact he was born in Dublin Road in Chum. Grew up in Bishop Street. Uh, he was born on December 17th, 1928. For some reason or another, it was mistaken he felt down through the years. It's even been said on television programmes and on radio programmes that he was born in 1929. But in fact, he was born in 1928. And it's very interesting, really, that four very well-known uh, people from the town of Chum, Sean, uh, his great friend and teammate, uh, Frank Stockwell, Julie Loftus, who played football with them when he was young, uh, late uh, publican uh, here from Chum and Tom Leo, very well known man as well, a pharmacist, also sadly passed away. They were all born within six months of each other in 1928. And Sean was less than 18 years of age when he first hit the headlines. Uh, in fact, the Chum Hurl, my own newspaper now, put a heading in the front page that the boy wonder had brought back the Hogan Cup. I had brought the Hogan Cup for the first time, actually, to St. Gerald's. Now the most famous Gaelic football nursery in the country, but of course they've won the Hogan Cup, which is the Blue Riband competition in second level colleges football. Um, they've won the Hogan Cup 12 times. The first time they won it was in 1947. Uh, it would have been the you know spring, early summer. So Sean was not yet 18 uh, when he got this heading, the boy wonder, and indeed, he was much written about in the national print media as well at that time because he was then, uh, uh, after Iggy Jones of Tyrone the previous year, he was then the top young Gaelic footballer in the country at 17 years of age. Sean was my best friend for years upon years and he's three years dead nearly now and I still miss him very much because he was one of the finest gentlemen I've ever met and one of the kindest, most compassionate men. You can talk all about his greatness as a footballer, but my estimation is true greatness lay in the fact of his his compassion for people and his friendliness. And yes, at times he could be he could be gruff, which was often misconstrued as being proud, or you know. But Sean never spoke of his exploits, or never spoke of his exploits on the field, and didn't want it to be. Um, you know, he didn't. He didn't want the adulation that he got up to his death. You know, these people coming up looking for his autograph was an embarrassment to the man. My first encounter with Sean on the football field would be when we we used to train for the minor team back in '59 and '60 in Chum Stadium, and maybe for a few evenings before the the current final, we would play a game against the senior team and at that time of course Sean and Frank Stockwell were known as the Terrible Twins but Sean really was a very, along with being a very classy footballer he was a very very strong footballer and he seemed to have this diplomatic connection with Frank Stockwell they could find one another so so well and Probably for us as, as miners, or for me especially, it really gave us great experience in playing top class footballers. And every trick in the game, Porcelain and Stockwell knew them. And at the same time, they were very gentle with us because if they wanted it, they could just beat us off the field, but they didn't. I never saw them playing. But I heard about their feet How one would get the ball Know where the other one would be And we share in all the glory Of their legendary wins Sean Perth, Frank Stockwell The terrible twin They both grew up together Our, our terrible twins is more of, a, more of a friendship Off the field than actually on the field I mean, since we were, as the fellows was an eye infant, we were buddies. And 
Football, of course, for a little poor old on the, the presentation is just a forzy. They started as a, I suppose we must have been six or seven years of age at the time. And from there on to the Christian Brothers. And with the Sister Forzy, she, she, she had their own way of, of with young, with children. Maybe she thought we were a little bit better than some of us around, but she put us on the first time, like, and I, I was just going to think of it. She put us playing on one another to see how we'd get on. And then she put us in opposition to see how we'd react. But she was the, she was far ahead of her time. You wouldn't believe it for a nun that must have been probably 50 years of age at the time, which was old now in those times. She knew so much about, not alone Galway or Toom and Galway, but every footballer in Ireland. And the one thing she used to always say, empty your mind was the one thing. You're playing a team game. It's not an individual's game. And it's the thing that possibly stuck in our minds more than anything ever. Was you were never an individual. She never wanted individuals. She wanted team players. And that's what that's how we really started. He was teaching down in near Dunmore and uh, the young kids down there used to call him Master. The Master. And uh, that's how that's how the nickname he was, uh, he got the nickname of the kids were calling him the master and they never wanted to start to call him the master. He never seemed to play bad. He was always, it, was, it came natural to him. And he, he was, uh, he had the gift of, of, of uh, being two feet, two foot. The left foot was as good as the right foot, and uh, I often seen him and he he playing and when he kicked the ball, it it my you'd often see a fella kicking the ball and it'd go well during the match he might put one or two of them, where five or six yards wide, but I never seen put putting a, a ball any more than two foot foot or two foot wide, if it did go wide. And uh, he was, uh, uh, he wouldn't expect anything more from you than what he'd put into it himself. He was, uh, he, he was, he was a very good, very good footballer, the best footballer I think I ever seen. MJ Malai, a famous Playwright from Milltown, Joe Malloy. He wrote a few classics. He wrote The King of Friday's Men and he wrote one of the great one act plays, The Paddy Peddler. But in The King of Friday's Men, which went on on Friday or on Broadway, there was a famous character in it called Goshkeen. Now, anyone that knows what Goshkeen means, or to Gosh means to be a boastful person. And Goshkeen had a line which I thought should have been. I thought it was written especially for Sean, and the line went as, I'm a quiet man for a man that needn't, and if I ever got vexed, I'd clear a race course. Now, Sean Purcell was one of the strongest men I've ever met, and one of the least boastful men I've ever met. And when he finished his career, I went to football matches 50 years later, and there was people coming up still looking for his autograph in places like Parnell Park. And I remember one day being in Breffney Park in, in Cavan and Mar Martin McHugh, he's now a pundit on television. And Martin had children with him and he pointed up at Sean person. He said, take a look up at the greatest footballer Ireland ever produced. You'll never see his likes again. Now, Sean at this stage hadn't kicked the ball for 50 years and Martin McHugh wouldn't have even never seen him playing, which I thought was extraordinary that people could come along 50 years later and talk about him as the master of them all.
Come all of you young lads who play Gaelic football The finest of games for the finest of men Out kicking all round, a win in all islands A game that's worth playing, that's worth playing well But the pull and the wagon, the fight and the skeleton, and going for the man, that's no good at all. The thrill of the game is the skill. Sean was, uh, and this is the best way I can put it really, Sean was just a lovely man. Uh, he had a wonderful personality, he had a very warm personality. Um, he was an all-rounder on the football field and he was an all-rounder off it as well too because you could have fun with him. But there was a lovely serious side to him too because of course he was a teacher and he was a very fine teacher and all his past pupils at that beautifully named Strawberry Hill National School between Schumann and Moore, they have the fondest memories of him. My name is Matty Gannon. I was a pupil of Sean's in Strawberry Hill National School. When he arrived at our school I was in third class and because it was a two-teacher school, it meant that I had almost five years of Sean teaching me. He was a very good teacher, but a very gentle, easy man. And when we started, of course, it was around the 1956 Football All-Ireland. When he won the All-Ireland, he brought the cup down to Strawberry Hill School and filled it with lemonade, so we all drank out of the cup as tiny tots. And then we went outside and we all had photographs of Sam Maguire. So in every house around Strawberry Hill there's photo photographs of small children holding up a big cup. It was a two-teacher school, so his responsibilities were really for the whole school, but especially for five classes of varying numbers in the class. And he taught us everything really, but but in a nice, easy manner. My previous problems with my previous <laughs> teachers were sort of very mixed, some very cross, some very nice, but he, at all stages, was a very nice teacher. Of course, if we misbehaved, we got a little whack of a cane, but that was normal at the time. I can always remember Sean taking penalties, like the power he could hit the ball at, you know, and, and uh, he rarely, I don't think I ever saw him to miss a penalty. His free taking also was exceptionally good. The other thing about Sean was that that he was always willing to give, you know, share things with you, and and uh, was also very helpful as it led up to all Ireland's, because we used to train in Chum and uh, having a few words with Sean, he'd always give you that great confidence in yourself, and also. He had that experience, which very few other fellas had. Like to me, like that, I don't think there's there's nobody really I could compare with him as a foot as an all round footballer, because he, he could play in any position, whether it was from the full back line to the full forward line, and wherever he played, he he could excel in them, you know. Sean himself was never that interested really in statistics or in records or anything like that. He bore lightly the reputation that he had as being the greatest footballer of all time and that was said of him. Uh, it was said that he was the greatest all-round footballer of all time. But of course, some great footballers who are defenders, well you can't say maybe that they might have been the greatest footballer of all time because they've never played in the forwards and vice versa. We could say that in modern times about some great Galway stars of our own here and of course like the great incomparable genius Morris Fitzgerald of Kerry, Peter Cannon of Tyrone and so on. Well, they weren't in backs. But of course, the point about Sean, and this is fascinating to people who know and understand football well, is that in 1954 he played, it is said, his greatest ever game at full back against Mayo here in his native Chump. I've never seen him, you know, no, a fellow running into him, showing them. And, and uh, I don't believe I've ever seen him getting knocked, you know. In a fair shoulder, you wouldn't store him. But uh, he was. Uh, I remember one day we were playing out the road in in in, in uh, Bridge. 
the ball was kicked in and it was lobbing in the square and, and, and Porter went for it and he got it. And if he made up his mind who was going to get a ball, he'd get it. But he he got it and uh, on his way out, the the Oakdale lads, four or five of them, went to shoulder him. He could shoulder a fellow that time, and it's not like now. But they hit him and it's out of the coat, and he he just kept going. There was four or five of them flattened before it, when he was kicking the ball out. Together. And as I say, it was more friendship off the field now than our, than our football. Then when we got married, we kind of... Well, we didn't break apart, but we, we, weren't, we didn't have the time that we had when we were single. But we were... I saw two of the closest friends I say of all time. Well, if we won any kind of kind of a thing that was to be won, we were we were lucky enough to win them. Like we had trips to New York, a few occasions, London, Birmingham, Manchester. We're rolling. One, two, three. It's an old recreation all over this nation From the Kingdom of Kerry up to Donegal We'll never grow tired of the ones who are inspired By the roar of the crowd and the flight of the ball I will see them on Sundays in sports fields and wasteland Practicing skills and giving it their all And there's no compensation for participation But the roar of the crowd and the flight of the ball Our Gaelic would perish if it wasn't for the parish The mothers wash the jersey, the fathers get the ball Their most treasured dream is their child makes the team For the roar of the crowd And the flight of the ball Yes, it's an old recreation All over this nation The game is never over Till you'd hear your mother's call And they'll never grow tired The ones who are inspired By the roar of the crowd And the flight of the catch it, kick it, stick it in the net that he was a supremely skillful footballer. He was blessed with all the arts and, and talents and gifts and graces of the game. He was a very athletic footballer. He had everything as a footballer, but he also had fantastic physical strength. Sean could ship tackles, he could ship punishment, because naturally as a star he'd be singled out maybe for special treatment, as we might euphemistically say. But he was a very, very strong man, so he could look after himself, he could mind himself at a time when maybe the star players weren't as protected within the rule book as they are now. So really he had it all. He was particularly blessed with great hands. He was a great fielder of the ball. He uh, also had a very strong punch of the ball. He would punch points. It's a lost art. You don't see that much now, except maybe on the run. Forwards running in, they'll punch it over the bar. But you don't see forwards standing back, standing up 40 yards out and trying to punch a point. Well, Sean could punch a point, certainly from around the 21-yard line or so, and further out indeed. And he was, of course, a great kicker of the ball off the ground or off the hand. But to sum up, he had it all. He had all the skills of the game. Postal was... was, was uh... He was the man. Uh, when he was off the field, then like I was saying here, when he was finished the football, uh, he never praised himself, or he never, he never uh, boasted about what he'd done or what he didn't do. And uh, he was, he was a long time, and he was carrying a lot of us on his back. And uh, he. Uh, He'd never talk about it again. He'd never say that a lot of for me you wouldn't win it or anything like that. He'd never, he'd never boast. And uh, that went for Frank Stockwell too and, and Nathan. They never, they never uh, boasted about what they'd done. 
he was the one man, I suppose, if anybody could ever say it, people have eyes in the back of their heads. John, definitely. He had the vision. Ah, he had everything. Sure, there was. That's why he was so perfect. So, um, all I can say is that I miss him terribly. He was Chung's most famous son. And I'll always remember, I think it was Luke O'Brien that said, when Chum lost the sugar factory, Chum lost its identity. And I remember writing to the Herald at the time and saying, it's not, it's not uh, Chum sugar factory that lose Chum's identity, it's when Sean Purcell dies, Sean, Chum will lose its identity, and which it has, because no matter where I went, whether it was England, America, anywhere, as soon as you mentioned Chum, they said, do you know Sean Purcell? So, as I say, he was legendary and without doubt the greatest man as a man and the greatest footballer as a footballer I ever met. At his funeral, footballers came from all over Ireland, former footballers, present day footballers. It was a truly extraordinary, quite remarkable gathering. It was certainly, um, as far as I could remember, the biggest funeral I'd ever seen in my native west of Ireland. And at that funeral, I think everybody realised that a true great of his chosen sport um, had, had passed on. But he was a man with a brilliant mind. He was in all respects really a brilliant man. But he was a lovely, warm, um, most human uh, of men. And it was a privilege and a great, great pleasure and great fun and a wonderful, wonderful, incomparable honour to have known him over a long period. And uh, we will never, ever forget him, what a great man he was. And truly, we will say of him, Nivai Elehe Danarish. I go away behind to leave you, perhaps never to meet again. But if we never have the pleasure, I hope we'll meet on Canaan's land. Farewell, my friends, I'm bound for Canaan. I'm traveling through the wilderness. Your company has been you who doth leave my mind distressed I go away behind to leave you Perhaps never to meet again But if we never have the pleasure I hope we'll meet on Canaan's land. Do you remember Monday, the night we brought the cup to tune? The bonfires were blazing, the brass band played a tune Oh, I'd woken in the morning, it was better than that dream The all-night celebration with the winning Galway team And the journey down from Dublin was the best we've ever done Heading home into the west, that soft September sun So we walked across the Shannon, I saw big hard men shed tears To see the cup in Connacht, after thirty heartbreak years Travelling slowly through the county, as the shades of night came down People celebrating at every crossroads, house and town. 